Presentation of dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. An overhaul of Idaho's entire public school system gets its first vote of approval today. So what would the newly amended Luna Plan do and what do stakeholders think? What do you say? Join in. Dialogue is next. Hello, I'm Joan Cartan Hansen. Thank you for joining us here on Idaho Public Television, on the World Wide Web, and on public radio stations. The Senate Committee today, the Senate Education Committee today, approved Superintendent Tom Luna's education overhaul. The plan isn't exactly the same as he announced last month. It was eventually split into three bills instead of one, and there were some aspects that were slightly changed. Here's how. In the technology piece, instead of requiring eight online classes as originally proposed, High school students would now only have to take four online classes. School districts could offer a blended model combining online and in-person instruction so long as the majority of the instruction time is online. And as for every high school student getting a laptop in 2012, well that's been changed too. Now districts will decide when and which students will be given mobile computing devices and the districts will decide whether the students will get to take the computers home or even if they get to keep them after graduation. Other parts of the technology proposal stayed pretty much the same. There would be more investment in the classroom and the state would pay for certain students to take college classes in their senior year, something known as dual enrollment. Luna's plan still calls for increasing minimum teacher pay to $30,000, and local school boards would have to conduct at least one performance evaluation before deciding not to renew an employee's contract. But Luna's plan to dramatically limit teachers' rights went basically unchanged. New teachers would not get tenure, educators could negotiate for salary and benefits only, and contracts could be offered for only one or two years. And nothing has changed in how he plans to pay for all this. Luna's proposal would eliminate more than 700 and possibly 1,000 teaching and other school staff positions over the next two years and would increase the average class size. I guess I just, I fail to see how this pencils out when you're adding in laptops and adding in paying for the long uh, online courses. Um, I, I simply can't imagine, unless you're making teachers work, you know, like even more than the already like 12 hour days many of them do. I just, I don't understand how you anticipate that fewer, 800 fewer teachers can accomplish all of this on top of, um, what they're already doing. We no longer live in a world where we can expect more and more money every year for education. So what does the education overhaul really mean? Last month we had Superintendent Luna on to explain his ideas. Now joining me are four other stakeholders in the education reform debate to share their thoughts and take your questions. In our Moscow studio is Mark Moore, Potlatch School District Board member. Mark, thank you for joining us. Uh, we, I, hopefully, I, let me go on, let me, I'm not sure we got our, we have Mark's audio, so let me, let me go introduce our Boise studio, our studio guest. So here in our Boise studio is Sherry Wood, president of the Idaho Education Division. Appreciate you being here. Appreciate Thank that. Thank you. And Karen Echevera, executive director of the Idaho School Boards Association. Did I get that right? Thank you, John. Good. Thank you for being here. And Maria Greenlee, a parent and PTO treasurer at Grace Jordan Elementary School here in Boise. Thank you for joining us. Thank I you, appreciate Jen. it. And of course, we want to hear from you. Give us a call toll free at 1 800 973 9800. Well, let me toss that first question out, and hopefully, hopefully, Mark, you can hear us. Uh, the, the bills did pass through today, so uh, as the political pundits say, unless there's an earthquake, these are going to fly through the rest of the Senate and the House. So you can either disagree with the political pundits or agree with them and tell us what does it mean for Idaho's classrooms. Let's, Sherry, let's start with you. Well, <clears throat> I don't think you can. Um completely make that decision tonight. I think there are a whole lot of other steps that have to take place before these bills become law. And we heard tonight that there could be trailer bills, there could be um, additional bills that would be added to the existing three bills. And so um, I, I don't really know what's gonna happen. It's too early to tell. Mark, what do you think? Do you think that the 
how will this affect your schools? Do you think this is going to go through now, or is there something that can be done? Do you expect more? <coughs> well, I, I concur with what, uh, of what part of what Sherry says in that I do believe that uh, the bills will ultimately uh, pass in what form, I don't know. Um, to me, it's, it's an exciting uh, new time to look at, and it's going to take a heightened uh, uh, opportunity uh, to work collaboratively uh, with the other stakeholders. Uh, but uh, the one thing that the school boards will have is they'll have greater flexibility in uh, working with their budgets and their personnel uh, to achieve what is uh, best for the students, and that's, that's what this whole goal has been about, is what can we do that is best for the students. Maria, you kind of you're new to this realm, and okay. and and so tell me about your reaction to today's passage and and the future. Well, I'm disappointed. As a parent, I'm very disappointed for my children, for our educators. Um, but I I am not giving up hope. I you know I expect the parents and the educators to continue to voice opposition. Um, I'll be speaking out at a rally on President's Day at noon outside the Capitol building, and so I, I just think it's really important we continue to just voice the opinion, you know, our opinions on this and our opposition. Let's talk a little bit about the practical aspects of the plan. What do you think people will notice first? The technology part, I understand, will take about 18 months to get implemented. What are we going to see first? Well, I think the first thing that's going to happen, obviously, is the negotiations with the teachers. So the labor pieces of this bill are going to begin happening soon because we'll begin negotiating those master agreements and contracts soon after the legislation is passed, if it is passed. So I think that's the first thing we're going to start hearing about will be the labor negotiations. And from the trustees' perspective, that was the bill that our survey received the strongest responses on and the strongest support for were the labor pieces of the, of the bills that came forward today. Obviously, you're on the other side of that fence. Absolutely. I think this is, um, I think this is a terrible move for Idaho. And um, I, I am... Um, I don't understand why it is that the School Boards Association believes that teachers really should have no voice at the table about um, their profession and um, I, I, I don't think it's going to play out in a positive way across the state just like it didn't before 1971 when, before we had a bargaining law. I, you know, I, I <clears throat> Teachers need a voice at the table, and they, they're not going to be happy if they don't have one. Mark, you're one of those school board members that will have to do the negotiating. What do you think? Well, I would disagree with Sherry. Uh, I believe the teachers will still have a voice at the table. For example, if you look at the pay for performance bill that apparently came out of committee today, there is a requirement uh, for um, the board to work with, uh, to c consult with, uh, to collaborate with uh, the teaching uh, group in order to develop the shares uh, that are going to go to the individual teachers. The language of the labor bill uh, still requires uh, the board to negotiate in good faith uh, with the teachers regarding salaries and benefits. Uh, and so uh, they will still have a, a voice there. Uh, I think schools around Idaho will continue to have um, district leadership committees uh, in which uh, the teachers will continue to have uh, voices. Uh, they certainly have curriculum committees, professional development committees in which uh, their voices are, are heard, uh, they're listened to, and they participate fully in. I, I don't think this this, uh, b these bills were ever intended to, to stop teachers from having a voice. Uh, that wasn't the, the intent of the bills. I think the intent of the bills was to help Idaho uh, and provide an education, a funded education for the students, the best education the students can get. Not the best possible, but the best education that the students can get. And I think uh, we're, we're going to do that. Um, and that's why I'm looking for the future. I'm looking for the future too, Mark, but um, 
I don't see how it is that, okay, so the law says that districts will negotiate in good faith. And um, then the law also says that there's a timeline in place. And so the district, the boards and the administrators can um, come together <clears throat> on the 1st of May and as happened in a couple of places in the emergency bargaining situation, they came together and the board said no, no, came together again, no, no, and then they imposed their last best offer. And in some places, they didn't impose their last best offer, they imposed a worse offer than the last best. And, <clears throat> you know, with those timelines in there, all the board has to do is hold out and then impose an offer. And so it's, it's not going to play out around the state in a very positive way. You're shaking and, and Joan, I, I don't think that's bargaining in good faith. I, I, I think that if, if the board continues to say no and no, then that's not bargaining in good faith. And, and I think keeping that piece of that, correct. And I think when if you bargain so, in good faith, which I have the faith that the trustees in the state of Idaho are going to do, is bargain in good faith, then, then, I, then I think that this will work. As, uh, and and, uh, and Joan, if, if I may respond to that as well. Sure. Okay, uh, you know, there, there has been a law in Idaho for a long time, it's 33, it's Idaho Code 33-515 sub 3. And it uh, said that uh, teachers could, be offer, uh, could, could not be offered a contract less than uh, their current wage or their current term. And so whenever uh, uh, teachers came to the bargaining table, they, had, they always had the benefit of knowing your contract will not get less. Well, you know, in, in tough times, in tough ec economic times, when you have to declare a financial emergency, you, you have to be able to say, uh, look, we, we need you to take a little bit less to make this thing work. Uh, prior to the last couple of years, we didn't, ha uh, until the, the financial emergency language got put in place, we didn't have the ability to do that. And so if you're gonna say it's not in good faith, was it ever in good faith to come to the table when you knew it would never be lowered, even well, though I, a, a, the economic situation may require it, I, or the or the the teachers themselves may want it. Let me let me jump in. So I, 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 let me I jump in here. I, th I think it I think it is safe to say that the rules of for negotiation have changed mm -hmm. pretty dramatically. That's right. Have flipped over. Good. Your opinion, whether that's good, bad, or indifferent, is is up to is up to the individual. But the, essentially, the rules have flipped. The, the, that's Boards have far more power than they used to have in terms of setting contracts, and there are far more limitations on what can be negotiated. So that's so just so for public information, that's kind of <coughs> where the status is. That's where we're going to. Let me get to my caller. So, I'm sorry, Becky in Napa. Becky. Yes. Go ahead. Well, it appears that Mr. Luna and our elected officials have forgotten that the original purpose of education was and is to create a civilized society, not an automated society. Removing teachers, enlarging class sizes, paying less but expecting more, and relying on more on technology removes the personal and essential interactions that are required in a civilized society. All right. Thank you for your call, Becky. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, it, it is tough. A lot of hard, hard feelings have been brought up through this process. Have we gotten to the point where we, we're going to need to really step back for a while before we can actually come together again on this issue? Well, part of the problem for me is that the legislation has been moving so quickly. You know, that this whole plan was introduced and moved so quickly that, I mean, I've just been trying to catch up with understanding the implications of it. Um, and to me, one of the biggest frustrations is that it's moving so quickly. So I'd love to be able to step back, I'd love to be able to um, have the people who really are in the know-how take a look at the plan and say, this is the effect it's going to have but we don't seem to have the time for that. Do we really know what this plan is going to do to our classrooms? Well, I think we know what big pieces of it are going to do. <coughs> I mean, obviously, with the divisor, we will see increased class sizes for the next few years. Um, I, I think uh, at the classroom level, the technology won't come into place for 18 months, so right. we will have a chance as um, stakeholder groups to sit down and discuss those technology pieces. Um, uh, but for now, I, I think the, the big part of it will, that we'll, we will see an increase in class size for the next couple of years. And, and at least 770, possibly more, fewer, I should say, fewer, that, teachers. fewer teachers. There's going to be a lot fewer teachers. Over the next couple of years, that's correct. 
Uh, are you, have you figured, have you got a game plan started, Mark, for your district? Well, uh, we sent out a letter to the uh, Education Association asking for them to start uh, to come to the negotiation table. Uh, preliminarily, uh, in looking at the numbers, we believe that we'll be down a couple of FTEs. However, even though we're going to be down a couple of FTEs, given the numbers we have in our particular district, I don't know that that's going to change the class size or the, or the class configuration. And I, th I think, you know, there, I think part of the disconnect here is, particularly in small districts, even though we may be getting uh, less money in terms of funding from the state, the, at the local level, at, at, you may pass a supplemental levy uh, that uh, allows you to continue to offer uh, people uh, in the classroom, the teachers in the classroom, those highly effective people who do such a wonderful job still at, at this level. So I'm not sure how it's going to work out. That's going to depend on what the community decides to do. And I think that that's a part of what Superintendent Luna was trying to, to allow us to do in this legislation is, is gain local control. Now, for, 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 for there are a couple of problems, though. Done that. I'm, I'm sorry, Mark. There are a couple of problems for those small districts that are small, poor districts may not be able to pass those supplemental levies. Do you? Well, let me ask the table in general. Do any that, of you have a fear that we may run into another lawsuit where we're getting an unequal education because poor districts can't pass the supplemental levies that the larger districts can to help make up for the difference in the the loss of state funds? Essentially, we're essentially we're getting a property tax increase. On the local mm -hmm. level, Do, are you, is there any fear of that? Well, and it was something that I mentioned even in testimony yesterday before the Senate Ed Committee. We uh, we do hear from our rural districts who can't pass those supplemental levies, and I think it's something that is going to have to be addressed at some point in time. Um, the districts that can pass supplemental levies, the districts that can't pass supplemental levies, and the impact that has. I do know that um, the past president of our association comes from one of those districts that can't pass a supplemental levy, and he is relying heavily on the technology piece of this and the ability to do online ca classes for the students in his district in order to make all this work. Let me get to another caller. We've got um, Fred in Coeur d'Alene. Fred. Yes, good evening. Good evening. Uh, the, the working guy like myself, uh, you know, uh, we have uh, you know, a, a pretty tough time making ends meet and what if we don't have uh, the, uh, the internet connection. What happens there? Uh, at home, at your internet at home? Yeah, yeah, I don't have internet here. Okay, well, let, uh, actually, here. that let that's let me get that question because that's a good one because they changed the plans a bit to, for that. So let me toss that out. My understanding is, right now, there's not assured that the district the students will be able to take the computers home with them. If they even it may not even be a computer. It may be something like an iPad or mm -hmm. or a netbook mm -hmm. uh, that. So mm -hmm. it may not matter that you're, you're, you don't have internet at home, your child won't have internet right. at home. Right. Because you may not be able to take the computer home. But then, as a parent, my question would be, are the text, is, is the homework, textbooks. are the textbooks on the electronic device? You know, how, if that can't go home and be utilized in the home, then how is that going to improve the child's education? Actually, that's a very good, that's a very good point because a number of districts, because there's no money for textbooks, are going to turn to electronic versions, which are you know, so instead of carrying eight mm -hmm. books in your backpack, you'll carry your your uh, your Kindle or your iPad or whatever. But if they can't take them home because there aren't enough of them, or mm -hmm. have you? I guess yes. that's something that has to be figured out in the next eighteen months. Well, and I think one of the things that's been talked about is that those lessons or plans or chapter or whatever would be loaded down onto the iPad or mobile computing device or laptop or whatever it's called at that point in time before the student took it home. But from the trustees' perspective, I, I think that that was a good change in the bill that gave, gave more of the flexibility to the school district level. And, and I suspect you're going to see policies all across the state about how those laptops are utilized, who gets to take them home, when they get to take them home, if they get to take them home. Um, so I, I think that was a good change in the bill to put more of that flexibility back at the school district level to make those decisions. I know there was a question, the, the Boise School District had a question about accreditation. Could you talk right. a little bit about that? Um, well, that's one thing, you know, 
that's an obvious concern. Um, my husband and I both went on to graduate school and would love to see our children receive a higher education. And um, actually, my seventh grader said, will our online courses be accepted mm -hmm. by university? So that was one piece of it, which I don't know the full answer to that. that um, but the other piece is that as the class size increases because, okay, so the, looking at the Boise School dis District, they're saying, all right, so we're going to need to make cuts. And right now, they're looking at if, if we leave the plan alone, it's a 4.6% cut. If, if the superintendent's plan goes through, then it's going to be a 7% cut in, in the budget. So they have to make the decision where the cuts are going to be, correct? So if you cut the teachers, the class size goes up. There's a certain point with accreditation process where if there are too many, the ratio is too many students per teacher, right. the school can lose accreditation. So the flip side is to cut ancillary staff. That's also part of the correct. Uh, the you have to have the, you have to have yeah. a librarian. You have to have a certain nurse number of counselor counselors. in order to right. be accredited. Right. You know, and so you know these things are really important to have those answers done before this continues moving through. I mean, that's why I just don't understand why it's being pushed through so quickly when we don't have answers. As a parent, I have a lot of questions still. I think that's what I I, I hear from educators is that. There are so many unanswered questions, and um, for any other bill that we'd be talking about, we'd be spending a lot of time to make sure that we had all the T's crossed and the I's dotted. And um, for whatever reason, this is on such a fast track that, that we can't spend any time to answer all those detailed questions, like the whole technology thing and what's going to happen when um, the fire uh, department comes in and says you can't have all these kids in this classroom. I mean there's a lot of nitty-gritty details that like we heard today from the 30,000 foot level well you know we can figure all this out and it'll be simple and easy but when it's on the ground and actually in play in the school district it's not that easy. Um, along that nitty-gritty detail LP sent an, uh, an email and has the cost of maintenance and broadband costs have are, is that addressed in the bill? It is. Uh, those are all going to be addressed with the contract that is held by the State Department of Education with the vendor that will be maintaining all of the mobile computing so, devices. So the maintenance. So the state's going to decide what every district has. Will the districts be deciding what mobile computing device they have in their classrooms, or is the state going to decide and then everybody has the same thing all across the it's state? It's my understanding that the state will issue yeah. that contract for mobile computing devices all across the state. So everyone's going to have the same mobile computing device. And then the contract will be with the vendor for the maintenance, the replacement, all of those things that the upkeep, all of those things will be with the contract that the state issues. But they don't want to give districts to the local control to decide what type of mobile computing device would be appropriate for their district. I think it's an economy of scale, scale at that point in order to, to do that within the budget that Superintendent Luna has issued. Uh, for instance, a small school district is not going to be able to purchase the mobile computing devices at the same rate Per, com right. per device that another large school district would. So I think it will be a statewide contract. And at 200, I guess $275 is what they've budgeted kind mm -hmm. of per device. It would be um, correct. If, uh, mm -hmm. um, so um, let's see, I have uh, another email question. Let me get down to my, we're walking through this things pretty fast. Um, Robert asks, if teachers are vital and important, how does removing due process and just cause value them as educators? If teachers are what? If teacher, if teachers are vital and important to the process, how does removing due process and just cause value them as educators? It doesn't. <laughs> when you, when you uh, remove just cause and due process, um, you basically um, can um, fire a teacher for any reason. And, you know, as I stated today in my testimony, the government teacher and the high school football coach um, has the mayor's son on the football team and he doesn't get to play very often. Um, wh what happens when, when the mayor is upset about that? And what happens to a teacher that is teaching um, a, a subject that might be somewhat controversial and parents come in and are very upset about it? You know, what happens to that teacher? And, you know, continuing contract um, doesn't protect ineffective teachers, it protects good teachers from unfair practices. 
And um, it also protects the district. Most parents, and I would think the district, would want to know in June when they go home that for the most part, they have the teaching positions already filled and ready to go in mid-August. And with this bill, it, it goes clear into July before, before um, teachers sign contracts. Um, I think it's going to stir up a whole lot of chaos out there and cause a whole lot pro more problems than it, than it brings solutions to this state. We're rapidly running out of time. I'm sorry, this is so complicated. It would be nice to have more time. We're, we are going to do a web extra tonight, so if you're <coughs> with us on the phone, stay with us. We'll catch you on the flip side, and we'll get you your questions answered in our web extra. And so in the last couple minutes, I want to give each of you just a real one last chance to talk about we're going to, the bills will con continue on. They'll head to the Senate floor probably late next week, maybe early the following week, depending on their Senate calendar, then have to go through the whole process on the House and off to the governor. What's going to happen between now and then? What, what are your predictions? And what do you want to know? And the other guy says, what do you really want to know in the end? What do you want to know? I'm sorry, I get to toss it to you well. first. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Just debating on the politically correct, correct thing. But, you know, I, I want to make sure that we are truly doing what is in the students' best interest and our teachers' best interest. You know, I, I want to see an education system in place that will help our students and that will really value our educators. Mark, let me toss it up to you. You, you know, Maria sa said it uh, very eloquently. Um, you know, as a trustee, I have uh, a number of people that I have to uh, look out for. I have to look out for my patrons. I have to look out for my students. I have to look out for my teachers. I have to look out for my administrators. Uh, I have spent uh, quite a little bit of time studying the bills. And it's, it's kind of like the, the last question about due process. Uh, when I heard uh, Sherry's answer, I, I flipped to my bill and I went, well, wait a minute. That section of the Idaho Code is still there. There's still a due process requirement. Uh, there is, is still the opportunity for uh, a hearing. Uh, and so I, I th uh, for me, I'm going to continue to study the bill. I'm going to continue to listen uh, to what my constituents uh, tell me about the bill and um, then support what needs to be supported and question what needs to be questioned. And I think that's been the, one of the great aspects of this process. Okay. We have heard wonderful questions and, and it's caused some changes already. I wouldn't say that there are not going to be changes in the future. Okay, really quick. I'm sorry, Karen. Well, I guess I, <clears throat> I would just end it by saying that I, I am saddened and the educators across the state are very saddened by the fact that it seems that for whatever reason teachers have become the enemy and I don't get that. I don't understand why the people that dedicate their lives to helping other people's children are now the enemy. And we, we have run out of time. There's, uh, we'll talk about your answers and your questions on the flip side. Also a bill on other unions uh, on that. We'll mention that too. Thank you very much for our guests for joining us. I appreciate it. Thank you for joining us and we'll see you here next time on Dialogue. Presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. To order a copy of this program from Idaho Public Television, call our toll-free number or visit us on the World Wide Web.